हरे कृष्ण श्यामा वेलकम बैक टू द मॉन्स पॉडकास्ट मच टुडे आई थॉट सिंस इट्स द वर्ल्ड अर्थ डे अर्थ डे कमिंग अप ऑन अप्रैल 22 वी कैन डिस्कस अबाउट द टॉपिक ऑफ द अर्थ एंड से हाउ टू लिव हार्मोनियसली विद द अर्थ विद द एनवायरमेंट एंड ब्रॉडली इन आवर करंट सिचुएशन वेयर वी हैव so many crises hitting humanity you have a road map or you have as in the usual style you have segments divided as to how we touch the topic yes so maybe i thought we could discuss first from a historical perspective uh, why how the evolution of ideas or evolution of world views has led to this current crisis then secondly we could discuss a little bit about what the vedic wisdom the bhagavatam and the vedic literature offer uh, what how does that world view contribute uh, to the current discussion and then finally we can talk about something practical so historical maybe philosophical and then we can talk about bringing it home together in terms of practically what can be done very good so historically at one level life in the world is tough and uh, there have been always uh, natural disasters of various kinds we know entire civilizations are sometimes been wiped out by floods or famines or volcanoes so <clears throat> i think in italy there's a pompeii where mount vesuvius a whole city was buried and later discovered so at one level it's understood that life uh, on the earth is tough it's dangerous and we human beings are vulnerable and there are various ways in which we try to deal with this vulnerability so traditionally we were very acutely aware of our existential vulnerability that nature is powerful and the powers within nature can crush us at any moment as uh, since uh, what is called a scientific enlightenment from the 16th century onwards as science started developing through science came technology and technology was one of the primary motives for developing technology was to gain power gain power over nature by which uh, we could at one level protect ourselves from the many dangers that are there in nature at another level we could counter nature's control or we could bring nature under our control so that we can make our life more comfortable we can not only make ourselves make more safe more control more comfortable and so we could say that first there was the vision that we have submission to nature then there is the domination of nature that was the vision that we had through science but then we have realized that it's not a matter of brute force that we can bring nature under control because nature has so many subtle and intricate mechanisms which are interconnected that it is just not possible for us to know all of them or control all of them so now more or less the vision is more of at least cooperation if not submission that we can't simply bend nature to our will we need to cooperate with nature so <clears throat> that's a quick historical perspective i can go deeper into it but i'd like to hear your thoughts yeah i concur with this idea that uh, nature feels looks like a very delicate feminine figure that like a typical movie villain can easily come and molest or take her away and this brings to my mind the imagery of the ramayan where sita is shown as very delicate and ravan is the mr big time enjoyer exploiter i get what i want type and in the later pages of ramayan uh valmiki muni very wisely reminds his audience that if sita wanted she could have destroyed ravan she is powerful but because of the particular past time sequence and she wants that lord ram should take the credit 
and for the greater good of humanity at that time and for millions of years to come. The sequence has to be in such a way that Lord Ram has to come and destroy Ravan. Hmm. But he intelligently reminds the reader that please for a moment do not think that Sita is not powerful enough to take matters in her own hands. And this is what I understand that uh, one idea which came in a first canto purport that aborigines or the prime, uh, primal primitive inhabitants of a deep dark forest, they bow down before a gigantic tree. They bow down before a mountain peak because that unscalable peak represents some part of nature which doesn't bow down to them. The tree in its majesty looks daunting. It's like when you come before me, kneel down. So humanity has always knelt, but out of force. So internally, the desire is always to conquer. Given half a chance, I'll build a dam. Given half a chance, I'll clear down the forest. Given half a chance, I'll exploit the ore or whatever from this area. Only when this mining is destroying my cities or when this mining is or something is poisoning my rivers, my rivers, of course, man always claims that whatever is here is his. So you're right to say that uh, uh, today we are at the cusp of a particular time where we don't have history of so much of technological progress, but we do have history of follies being committed in trying to control nature. And one uh, subordinate point to that is like in India, kings were called Bhu Dev, like a lord of yeah. earth. And surprisingly, or sometimes not surprisingly, I don't see, I don't remember much of the so called Christian world, but in the Islamic conquest, the words, the words for earth are Alam and Jaha. So, Alam Pana, someone who is capable of giving refuge to the whole earth. Alam Gir is somebody who is in control of the whole earth. So, even there, the notion is that the king is like a controller of this whole earth, which we don't have much of a problem, provided the king acts like a custodian of reserves rather than an exploiter. Okay. So today we don't have kings, but they are simply replaced by CEOs of MNCs <laughs> or, okay. or prime minister or presidents who can take a decision like the current president of Brazil. He is saying that uh, you don't teach us how to take care of our economy. I am going to give corporations the permit to to clear away Amazon forest lands because we want to have economic progress. So now this is seen as practical from one point of view, from Brazil's point of view, and is seen as complete madness from the world's point of view. So today, if a country says, if the world is not coming to help us, why do we care about them? So on this Earth Day, these kind of questions need to be answered. It's like one person said, we are all in a ship. And if one person says, I'm going to saw a hole in my particular floor. And I can do whatever I want because this is my room. But if that floor is, it happens to be at the bottom of the, near the bottom of the ship. And if water seeps in, it's not like only his room is going to go down. The entire ship will go down with that. So we are just still on the historical discussion as to how uh, mankind always wanted to. Mankind has suspicion that mat mother, uh, material nature can be controlled. There is always an effort to control. And uh, historically, we need to learn something from this. So these were some points. Is, 
I like the example of a ship or a boat. I think in Kunti Maharani's prayer, she says, "Bhuo na ivo dadhau." So the earth is compared to a ship or a boat, and of course, there it is. The metaphor is more of uh, the earth being burdened. So if a ship becomes the weight of the ship becomes too much, it cannot float. But what was what what is worse is the ship is. Somebody inside the ship sabotages it, makes a hole. Then it's going to completely sink. So that we live in an interconnected world has probably become so enormously obvious, or so painfully evident, so undeniably obvious during the COVID pandemic, mm. that um, what happens in one part of the world can within days. Influence the whole world, bringing it to a standstill practically, and slow, of course, slowly recovering. So, in the past, we could say that even when wars would happen, before the First World War and Second World War, even when wars would happen, no matter how fierce they would be, they would not affect other parts of the world much. But uh, now. The, sec- the first world war, second world war, where wa- almost the even though they called world wars, we may say that not almost. It's not that the entire world was involved at that time. But now that the world has become so connected because of because of trade, because of uh, tourism, because of immigration, <clears throat> geopolitically things, so they affect each other so fast and so extensively. that um, concern for the earth has to be a shared concern it is uh, n- nobody can say that i'll do what i want with my part of the world because what we do in one part of the world is going to affect us affect everyone not just that part of the world so having said that there is this still a uh, concern that uh, in one sense the developed world has already exploited the earth and created enough pollution and now they say that we are in a position where we can go green or at least the developing world says that we are in a position where we can you are in a position where we can go green you can become green but we are not in a position and if you ask us to stop development or arrest development right now that is simply your means of uh, staying in power so you know while there is at a at a nominal or even at a intellectual level the acknowledgement that we all need to be concerned about the earth but but at a practical level there are a lot of heated differences between countries and even within countries between groups about how to go about doing this and my understanding is this is not just this will not be resolved simply by better some better negotiation or politicking it is it requires a more fundamental change of world view which before before a more more tangible policy that addresses our shared concerns will emerge any thoughts so if that is the what is the segue can vedanta wisdom or bhakti wisdom offer something to somebody who's not a follower of vedanta life like we may say somebody may say both of you are discussing this but you are your 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 outward appearance shows that you are committed to following a certain path do you have something which can appeal to our intellect that we should change our world view yes perfectly agree with that so my understanding would be three things would be relevant over here first is that if we consider our actions they are, whatever actions we do they are determined not simply by okay this is what i want and this is this is how i am going to get it underlying our actions there are there are world views there are world views which shape our actions and the fundamental world view so science and technology 
they operate based on a particular world view where the idea of the earth is basically a, a insatient uh, celestial object where coincidentally or by lucky accident as some people say life emerged and we have all the variety of lives right now so the idea is that the earth is simply an arena for for existence but uh, the more there are alternative now this world this vision the earth is simply an arena for existence so as long as we can exist and we can enjoy we can do whatever we want with this arena this is a this is a ill informed world view because that in one sense gives us the license okay if it's it's just like a backdrop so if we consider this is a stage on which we are doing some drama so whatever i want i will rearrange the backdrop accordingly but if you consider the earth is not just a backdrop it is not just a stage for the human drama but it is also you could say a participant in existence so many traditional world views have had a more inclusive vision of the earth's role so it mentioned earth has been personified so like you talk about bhudev the king is called as bhudev the lord is also sometimes called as bhudev uh when he descends on the earth and the earth is called as bhudevi so this idea of the earth as a conscious participant in in existence not just the stage for existence but that can that can alter the world views can alter our approach significantly now if i think that say this particular just like we are becoming more aware of say animals and uh, uh, the pain that animals go through then there are people there are people with conscience okay this meat i am eating this is causing so much pain to these animals and is killing them do i really want to cause this much pain can i eat something else so as the atrocities against animals are becoming more and more evident say human consciousness is rising and to some extent veganism is becoming popular there are other reasons also like the health benefits and other things but the point is if we see something as an object we think that i can do whatever i want with it if i objectify it if we see animals as basically essentially insentient beings meant to be eaten consumed by humans but if we see animals as conscious beings then that exploitative tendency goes down so similarly if we see the earth simply as an object then okay we i can do whatever i want with it but if we see it not as an object but as a as a person as a as a subject as a conscious being then we can that that impetus for living in cooperation and not seeking domination on the earth that can get a greater foundation ideological or philosophical foundation for it what do you think uh yeah i have two small points which i feel i have that they have impressed me very solidly first one is from the ishopanishad which categorically says that whatever you look around is complete in itself especially talking about nature this universe it is completely equipped as a whole unit there is nothing redundant and nothing extraneous okay. you want something probably you want something and earth has already sensed that this need could arise and provision has been made for that you just need to be intelligent enough to look around properly so among many so called leaders of science and technology a kind of disdain a kind of arrogance slowly seeps in that material nature did not have this provision and we made it something is only so much sweet but we have discovered something which is 3000 times sweeter than natural sugar and then you find that that so called cheap sweetener causes hepatitis b causes cancer causes so many things 
So we are again back to square one. So the first point as a message to our Earth Day listeners is that this particular part of Vedic wisdom insists that everything is complete, but that completeness has to be discovered. You need to have a particular training. You need to have a particular culture to understand how everything is complete. Because from the beginning, because we say wants are unlimited, resources are limited, obviously there has to be a conflict. So where does completeness and a complete whole come in? So that requires some training and culture. Second point is about uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam text where a very powerful personality, intelligent, wealthy, prosperous, and at the same time spiritually trained, this king, as he befits the title of Bhudev or the Lord of the whole planet, and he sees the discrepancy. And there is a dialogue between him and Earth, who has taken a personified form. And he challenges her, as a king, I am responsible to feed my subjects. Why aren't you feeding them? And the answer given is, the answer for all ages. There, personified earth says, King, do not think there is shortage of anything. But I won't release the resources if I see that they could be misappropriated. That is, falling in the hands of people who are not capable of having that. Like, for example, if today's nuclear codes, if they fall in the hands of a terrorist group, Everybody agrees that should not happen. If the gold of a particular country, the entire thing falls in the hands of criminals, that also people agree it should not happen. So that should be so there is a clamor for common custody of the earth's resources. Hmm. And that has to be headed by somebody who is trustworthy. So here the king is asking Earth why I'm not feeding, and she says there is no shortage. I have just withdrawn resources because I cannot trust people or I cannot trust elements who will not cooperate with me. So here the cooperation element is you take, again to quote from the Ishopanishad, you take whatever is your quota and leave it for others, which includes animals and other species also. So to just to summarize, one point is seeing seeing the completeness, which requires some training, and the understanding that, that there is no shortage. We just need to improve our status, our intellectual status, our spiritual wisdom, and then the resources, the key will be delivered to us because resources are not lost or not destroyed. Yes. Yeah, this uh, point you made about completeness, Om Purna Vada Purna Midam, and that has that can be quite puzzling for the modern psyche because we may say that there are so much so many things that are wrong in nature. So as you said, that completeness has to be understood properly. So here are some thoughts about appreciating that completeness. So at one level. The material world is a place where things are temporary, where things are limited. So in no way will we ever come to a situation where, say, all our desires can be fulfilled. As it is said, there is enough in this world for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. Well, not, not, even for one person's not enough for even one person's greed. Yeah, one person's yeah. greed. So, so when we talk about the completeness... The, the completeness is never going to be appreciated or realized or actualized if we are thinking of completeness means complete arrangement to fulfill my greed. So, in one sense, to realize the completeness, there are, there are two aspects. One is, we could say, the inner enlightenment. Mm -hmm. The inner purification, the inner enlightenment. And then there is the outer development, the outer transformation, the outer change in society. So we could say that 
in some ways so in principle changing outer things to make them more favorable is not wrong the pandavas when they got a, a baron or a, they got a, a kingdom that was a part of the kingdom that was like a wasteland the khandav they they made it into a flourishing kingdom so they did so changing the outer to make what we could call as outer development they convert a, build a kingdom where there is build a flourishing city where there was a wild forest that is not in principle wrong uh, but the point i feel the challenge comes up where there is only outer development and there is no inner enlightenment in one sense in modern society we may have got the the worst of both the worlds in the sense that through technological advancement we have gained far more power to say control and change the outer world than what was available uh, to humanity in, in recorded human history recorded in contemporary historical terms so you know we can destroy forests by using explosives we can devastate the earth by by various technological means even not just weapons of mass destruction so we have got technology that gives us ex- uh, exceptional and you could say exceptionally dangerous power to control the outer world at the same time because of the increasingly materialistic culture that has spread across the world there is lesser and lesser inner enlightenment and there is more and more of a exploitative mentality so we could say the exploitative mentality internally and then the powerful or aggressive or destructive technology externally now all technology doesn't have to be destructive but this combination of technology with the power for destruction and the mentality geared toward exploitation that is a deadly combination which is created an immense amount of havoc in the world so that's why uh, the idea of realizing completeness it becomes a very far fetched idea and we think that i have to do this and i have to do this and i have to do this and that's when uh, i'll gain completeness but the com- the sense of completeness never comes and because the mentality for exploitation inter- internally is is insatiable and then that insatiable mentality leads to more and more indiscriminate use of technology externally and that it's becomes like a worsening spiral any thoughts on this i can share one small thing yeah that generally like this this example is always given that if you have a sack of grains let's say a sack of grains falls from a truck a simple occurrence in india there is a truck which comes to the grocery go down and then um uh, one sack of grain falls so a sparrow comes and pecks at three four a crow comes a pigeon comes and then if the grains are edible for sheep or for goats they may eat more so we see the members of the animal species they eat according to their quota and then they leave the area there is no question of thinking about tomorrow but man has this special intelligence where if i have a to real example where the sack falls a man will shout at his wife and his children and say hey come help me get this back to our home because we found it and we can use it for the next two months so this kind of storing mentality is shown as man's superior wisdom understanding that i can make better use of this and i don't deny that but when uh in like if we see in today's times 1% of the super rich if they control 25% of at least the financial resources which gives them the power to exert that influence over material resources then it becomes a frightful thing for example i read a quote 
that if the poor are always told that whatever food falls whatever food scraps fall from the table of the rich that will be given to you then the understanding is provide the table of the rich with more and more food so that more and more scraps can be available oh god okay but this is fundamentally flawed because one after some time the majority who are always thinking that we can never trust the powerful or the elite with our welfare then there is strife strikes breakdowns murders or violent overthrow governments are overthrown and all the other kinds of things happen spiritual culture for instance you say vedic wisdom i have i have worked hard let's say somebody says i have worked hard on this particular plot of earth and i have gotten so much vedic culture will teach us you take your quota tena tetena bunjita you take your quota and as part of your spiritual culture you are also told to share with others not as giving them handouts or not treating them treating them like beggars there has to be a system for that so your satisfaction is part when you enjoy what you have earned by the sweat of your brow and part is by your sharing that makes you complete that is also part of the purnam there is a part of uh, vedic history where powerful people under the guidance of wise intellectuals knew exactly how to work mother earth as farmers traders or whatever and they also knew how to share so today that understanding part of how to treat as you said not to see earth as an arena for my exploitation and then when you get something in order to perpetuate okay perpetuate could be a long kind of a shot at least to give the next generation some better place than what i had even this norm is seen as a rarity in today's political leaders that the only goal i have is i would like to leave this country in a slightly better place than what i found it in fact people say by the time i am out and you try to understand the mess that i have created i should be far away and retired from politics hmm so why this fear why this apprehension that i could be held accountable for what i have done yeah so the two things over here i think uh, that not everybody in human society is is evil or or destructively self centered but unfortunately those who are in power or a significant portion of those who are in power mm, are like that and i feel that there are two three different things over here one is ignorance second is incompetence and third is malevolence so when when we do things which end up uh, dis- destroying the earth as a place of residence for future generations it could be at some level because of ignorance they say for example when we started using fossil fuels we had probably no idea that what cost it would have eventually for yeah. the earth's future so it could be in incog- in, in, ignorance then there is incompetence you know there are maybe possibly more efficient ways of doing things but we don't care say like for example we have a vehicle somebody has a vehicle which they can fix a little bit and it can it may pollute less but they just don't they don't care to do it not that either the the, the manufacturers don't manufacture sufficiently carefully people don't handle it sufficiently carefully so it's incompetence and then there is malevolence where people just not only they don't care 
or they can't do they don't know but it is it is more of uh, they just desire at one level as long as as a, my purpose is served who cares about anything else so in fact uh, some people have the idea that my success has to be at the top of others failure so we could say that uh, those who are malevolent it's very very difficult to persuade or reform them they actually need to be restrained sometimes even by force yes but the other category and maybe i can add one more in between is there is ignorance there is incompetence and there is negligence so incompetence and negligence are similar so incompetence means i don't do things well enough negligence means i don't care to do things well enough so i think how uh, uh, there is a significant number of people in the world who fall in the first three categories ignorance incompetence negligence and s- some amount of uh, education for that purposes awareness not just thinking awareness for that purpose can make a significant difference so one area where i see a significant uh, can i move on toward the some as- part. some aspect solutions a- part now yes yes sure that so one area where i see a significant change happening is that uh, say for example with respect to uh some aspects of environmental consciousness at least in where there has been education awareness created people do try to do some things as much as they can so for example there are the three r's which they talk about reduce re, uh, reduce reuse and recycle and in many places there are attempts made for example we have dustbins where well, something is recyclable something is not recyclable and some people may just not know about it but people who know about it and they are made aware they do take care of these things i see that in some ways we may say that the generation which is growing up now they may be they may be straying away from traditional cultures but there is a certain level of awareness there so i would say the environmental consciousness is much more say now in the younger generation in the then in some of the older generation also again i don't want to make blanket statements mm-hmm. but so if awareness can be created then the three things the ignorance incompetence negligence that can be avoided and even in the when we talk about the super rich yes there uh, there are people who are up there who are competent and they arise not by power but by competence so you give the example of uh, how the poor get the scraps of what is what is the feast for the wealthy you know that's that's where the wealthy are out only to exploit and dominate now another way of looking at it so i'm talking that not everybody is malevolent that say in general some people have to become wealthy before more people can become wealthy what i mean by this is if we consider some symbols of wealth say for example cars or phones or computers uh, or internet now all these have become very common in today's world but just 10 15 20 years ago many of these things were very expensive so but there are some people who funded it some people who maybe may, may have been at that time very wealthy they wanted it and in one sense it was developed for them and when it started serving a felt need of humanity then mass production started happening and then the it became more accessible so the out, what i am trying to say over here is that the the problem is not with outer development per se we could have technology if if it is done with sufficient awareness sufficient proper consciousness then technology can also be used to do good and there needn't there can be a hierarchy that becomes exploitative but there can be a hierarchy which also becomes like a trickle down effect which spreads to everybody so um, while uh, through education we can through awareness we can have this re- re- reduce reuse recycle and that's important at a particular level that will not be done sufficiently unless there is i, I talk about a fourth r as redirection 
there's a redirection of human consciousness a redirection of our understanding of what is it that makes life meaningful fulfilling if we think that uh, this life is all that i have and if by the time i die why should i care for anyone else then that vision that materialistic world view makes us uses very little reasons for caring for the world on the other hand if we have a more spiritually informed world view that life's greatest fulfillment is not just in uh, accumulating things in possessing things and controlling things life's greatest fulfillment comes in something higher in raising our consciousness in contributing to others in connecting with the ultimate reality in doing the things that provide us meaning so then that raising of consciousness uh, can actually ensure that the destructive use of technology the destructive exploitation of the earth that can be minimized so what the vedic uh, wisdom can provide distinctively certainly reduce reuse recycle the awareness for that has to be presented more and more but along with that if the redirection can be provided the 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 intellectual foundation the the that can be provided for redirection then it's likely to have a more sustainable and wide ranging change that can happen i i truly agree in fact as we are uh, doing this particular podcast at as a special uh, request from our gv administration so the beginning for any newcomer especially somebody who a city dweller intellectually understanding i need to do something cannot cut away from my job family duties and staying in a city but taking a few hours or a day or a weekend off and spending some time in a eco conscious atmosphere may be the right spark it could be just a spark in the beginning but that can spark that interest which could lead to making those small changes in your lifestyle uh, i like this japanese concept of kaizen small incremental positive changes uh at a at a fixed time schedule so the changes are very small but they are positive and over the period the benefits are large mm. so somebody can just change from cutting down plastic usage somebody might cut down from using uh, artificial ingredients that is the cutting part somebody can start adding things like you said at one point of point of time a mobile phone would fit in a large suitcase now it fits in the upper shirt pocket so somebody selflessly quote and quote put their money so that this technology can be used more people use only then it will be profitable the same principle can be applied to expanding eco conscious products if people invest in them now make them proliferate through the market with more people using them more demand eventually a business model would like to earn money and there is nobody stopping him from doing that it's only that if you wisely invest in products which are going to help mother earth heal then it could be a very uh, it could be a right step in the right direction yes just thought of a couple of things when you mentioned this that small incremental changes that is such a crucial thing to understand because sometimes may feel that the earth's problems are so huge what can i do there are billion dollar corporations that are that are having a exploitative agenda what can i as a tiny human being do but uh, there is this concept of a ripple effect you know each of us is connected to a significant to some number of people and our actions they speak often our words speak and our actions speak sometimes louder than our words so each of us who makes a healthier choice we contribute to making a better world and that healthier choice can be both ways it can be in terms of the 3 hours 
reduce reuse recycle but an even more significant way we can contribute is by redirecting our consciousness that each of us if we take some time to spiritualize our consciousness now there was this global summit on uh, <clears throat> there have been several global summits since the 1980s 1990s as the magnitude of the environmental crisis started registering within the collective human psyche uh, scientists felt that scientists and researchers and policy makers felt that if we just alert humanity to the magnitude of the danger that will lead to behavioral change but then they found that actually just knowledge was not enough Mm-hmm. even when people knew they were not able to they were not changing things uh, so that's when uh, the i think from 2009 there was a international summit on that time onward they said that the there are uh, scientists said in, they started saying that we need the cooperation or we need the active involvement of religious and spiritual teachers because dealing with the environmental crisis doesn't just require changing of external behaviors it requires a change of consciousness is a change of attitude the change of mindset and that technologies can't do so nowadays the united nations has started uh, uh, working with a new genre there are ngos non governmental organizations and now they call it as fbos faith based organizations so these fbos basically their idea is that they each of every religious tradition every spiritual tradition has some kind of faith and based on that that they can influence a demographic in society so that change of consciousness for that we require not just greater technological advancement or even just greater education about eco friendly habits but a more holistic world view and while various traditions can have different conceptions of the earth and different conceptions of the interaction between humanity nature and divinity i feel the the vedic world view offers a very significant uh, significantly inclusive and attractive understanding so we could put it as uh, so i'll talk about the vedic world view in a minute or two but would you like to respond to something of what i have spoken till now no no you can, I, you can just summarize yeah. yeah so just krishna says in the bhagavad gita that sarva yoni shu kante ya murtaya sambhavantiya tasam brahma mad yoni aham bija pradapita this is i am like the father so we could say that this is not just a universe it's a universal family vasudaiva kutumbakam the earth is like a family so we could say the divinity is like the uh, is the is the father the earth or nature is like the mother and not just we human beings but all living beings are like the children in the lap of nature and this vision sometimes there is this uh, human exclusivism that we humans are special but the vedic scriptures is everybody on the earth everybody in existence in fact is a part of one family and that consciousness it's it's not just a sentimental sentimental imagination but there is a significant amount of philosophy which grounds this the understanding that the trees that we are cutting down that somebody might be cutting down uh, that you know we are souls we are spiritual beings who go through various lifetimes and we might have in the tree at some time you know i saw once a drama in a, which is done by kids in um in america they they just like eco friendly and they said that somebody is uh, about to kill an animal to eat it and then that person gets a vision that actually the animal who is being killed that animal was the killer in a previous life it was like a transmigratory drama where they said that by the law of karma whom i am killing that person was the killer was the killed the killer and the killed are just inverted positions so the idea that we have 
that we are all interconnected not just in the sense of our present survival but a world view which says that essentially all living beings are not different from us not just all human beings irrespective of gender race religion or nationality or whatever else but all living beings are essentially like us so that creates that shared ethos that that we all have to share and care for the earth so the vedic wisdom not only i'll conclude with one more point that there is for for this inner enlightenment or inner transformation to happen for the redirection of consciousness we need two things one is like a philosophical vision and then there is a there is a practical process okay how do i raise my consciousness and in this regard also i the vedic uh, tradition offers very empowering practices of yoga meditation and prayer by which anyone and everyone can raise their consciousness so it's not just okay there is some divinity out there and i pray to him pray to that divinity but there are tangible practices there are practices especially for this cosmic age the power of sacred sound is considered extremely vital extremely potent in transforming human consciousness so <clears throat> the ch- changing that exploitative mentality to a more contributive mentality that can dramatically happen if somebody adopts the process of say sonic meditation if on the ch- meditating on the sound on the sacred sounds there are many sacred sounds which are called as mantras among them there are especially sacred sounds which are mantra centered on on invoking the divine or on invoking the ultimate reality so that mantra chanting it might seem to some like simply a sectarian religious activity or just a activity for one's own spiritual development but actually it is not just that it is a activity that can contribute to changing the way individuals behave in society and in this way gradually contributing to making the uh, making humanity live more harmoniously on the earth any thoughts about this no i just uh, saw my notes so maybe you can summarize okay so so we discussed on the topic of the earth today the on the occasion of the world earth day started by we talked about historical then spiritual and then practical so the historical perspective is that in the past we lived in trepidation or submission of nature because nature could destroy us by any means at any moment then through technology as we gained power we started uh, uh thinking that we could have domination over nature but considering how intricate nature's mechanisms are we have now realized that we have to come toward cooperation with nature and in that connection you took the reference of ramayan where say the exploitative ravan was able to temporarily dominate sita but she had the power to to destroy him if she wanted to so similarly sometimes it may appear that we humans have been able to control nature and bend nature according to our will but nature can just uh, re- there can be a resurgence of uh, reactions that show humanity that we don't have a supreme place in the dispensation of things and then we talked about how there are different uh, how the exp- uh, basically we humans in modern times seem to have got the worst of both worlds or worst of both the outer and the inner there has been there is a technology externally and there is the mentality internally so we have a technology that can ha- bring about immense destruction and then we have we have mentality that is bent on exploitation and that can cause great devastation and unfortunately the technology is falling in unscrupulous hands and there is no world view that no sufficiently deep or coherent world view that can warrant people regulating their destructive mentalities so we talked about you mentioned about the idea of completeness in nature that the instinct for development uh, if it is driven by the idea that nature is incomplete and i am going to make it complete 
then how are you defining completeness if we define completeness in terms of complete arrangements for fulfilling my my cravings then the nature will never have enough even for one person's greed but to differentiate between that greed and need we need inner enlightenment and unfortunately the materialistic world view doesn't provide us any inner enlightenment it actually provides us uh, a vision of the earth very objectified as an arena for our our enjoyment and exploitation whereas if we treat the earth as a as a conscious being as a, a participant in existence not just a stage for existence then we will see that that vision can foster cooperation much more so you talked about the story of this great king prutu that the earth when it when there was shortage it is not that there is actual shortage but the earth is withdrawing because resources because of the exploitative mentality of people and and if we are to change things we talked about you mentioned the kaizen principle that small positive incremental changes can make a significant difference so rather than feeling that the earth is so <clears throat> that the problems of the earth are so big that we can't do anything about it we can start in our lives by doing what we can and what can we do there are two approaches externally we can do the three r's reduce reuse and recycle and small eco friendly habits can also make can accumulate to make a significant difference and similarly we can go inward to re the fourth r which can be added to complete the three r's is to com- that is redirection so redirection of our human energy and endeavors that we don't have to pander to our desires and gain control over the externals to become happy rather if we evolve spiritually and connect with ourselves and alt uh, connect with the ultimate reality therein we can find deeper satisfaction so seven scientists and policy makers have realized that just greater awareness doesn't lead to transformation in people there has to be uh there has to be a participation by the spiritualists who can actually bring about change in inner values and inner attitude so that's why along with ngos there is the idea of fbos coming together coming up now and uh, in that connection we talk about redirection that there is the vedic script, vedic wisdom can offer us a philosophical world view that it's an inclusive world view vasudhaiva kutumbakam divinity as the father nature as the mother and all living beings not just all human beings in, apart from all, of different races and race different races religions and nationalities but all living beings are a part of one family and so that vision can foster cooperation and shared care, sharing and caring much more and for raising consciousness we also need practical resources pra- practices so yoga, yoga meditation praying and especially mantra chanting in this age are powerful ways by which we can all transform uh, the exploitative mentality into a, a more contributive mentality so people's attitude towards the environmental problems may range from ignorance incompetence negligence to malevolence so those with malevolence they need to be curbed but those with ignorance incompetence or negligence if they are spiritually informed then they can make significant changes and we can make the earth uh, make and make humanity's uh, presence on the earth more harmonious with the earth and the ultimate purpose of existence anything you would like to conclude concludingly add so we would just like to wish all of our viewers a very happy and enlightening earth day and may this be the harbinger of a small beginning in awareness so you can connect to your local nature conservation group ecological conservation group or someone like the gordanico village which could be having so many programs to as you said in the second part that is practical steps needed to be taken to enlighten yourself spiritually so that you can be a worthy inhabitant of this beautiful planet which has been which is a like a a uh, privilege bestowed upon us and it's not as a to end one wise person said as a child of mother earth we have full right over her milk but not over her blood 
Oh God, it's beautifully put. So that's a very memorable thought. To differ, it's a very memorable vision to differentiate between need and greed. Also, this. Thank you very much for sharing your thank you thoughts and having this discussion. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.